Hey, everyone. So as the last speaker, I'm obligated to make a joke about being the only thing between you and happy hour. Um, that was the joke, by the way. I'm very self-aware and witty. So let's get into this. Uh, I'm Michael. I'm a UI engineer at HashiCorp. HashiCorp is a cloud infrastructure automation company. So you may have heard of some of our products, including Vagrant, Packer, Terraform, Vault, Nomad, and Console. They are all developed to enable and sometimes create new workflows for DevOps professionals. The one I work on is called Nomad. It's a cluster scheduler. So it is meant to easily deploy applications at any scale. The way that it works, oops, the way that it works is by being an agent that runs on every single server in your cluster or your compute cluster, and then it makes it so you can basically tell it to run jobs and it'll figure out where to put that stuff. Uh, this isn't a nomad talk, so I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty. We can talk about that later if you want. But the takeaways here is that there's lots of stuff going on inside of Nomad all the time. And most of this action is coming from the cluster itself, but users still wanna stay informed. So we can't get away with waiting for user interaction to update views. Well, I mean, I guess we could. This is GCP and AWS. They both have these tacky refresh buttons. Uh, and that works. But well, the seams are starting to show between people who use tech and people who make tech, where this kind of solution doesn't seem so good. Even people who aren't making tech understand that this is kind of dated. They'll look at that and they say, why can't that just happen automatically? Twitter will tell me about new tweets. My email client pushes notifications. Lyft and Uber will at least attempt to tell me where my driver is. And Spotify tells me what my friends are listening to, and I never even ask them to do that. I just don't care. <laughs> so why can't your web app do this? And it's the fact is, and everything novel and great will eventually become commodity. And great becomes standard and standard becomes dated. And that's just the way life is. So let's go real time. At least that's how we felt inside of the Nomad team. So time passes. About a year ago is when we released Nomad, the web UI, for the first time. And around the start of this year is when I worked on making all of our views real time. So this uh, was a pretty interesting project. It took about three months. And it went from being kind of your typical out-of-the-box Ember and Ember data app to something that is more lively. Uh, and to start things off, I would like to, whoops, to give a demo of that. So here is Nomad. This is what the UI looks like. And this is iTerm2. It's lovely. And I'm going to run some commands here. Uh, maybe I'll bump that up a couple. Then I'll run clear again so you don't see that. Uh, and then I'm going to run Nomad, run example. This is just like a text file that describes what a job is. When I run that, should get a job now over here. Let me shrink this a little bit. And if I click into this, we'll see now that it's running. Oh, look at that. Um, since I resized it, it already finished. Let me change this just a little bit here. So I'm gonna configure this to take more memory. And now if I do nomad run example again, we'll see this update. Now there's a new active deployment that looks a little funny because I'm zoomed in. But we'll watch this kind of go through the states here. I have to promote this canary, click that, we see there's a queue, goes, everything's kind of updating without me having to pay attention to it. And that's exactly what we want. This stuff is happening server side, and I shouldn't have to press a refresh button to see that. And sometimes things happen really fast. So I have another job in here called batch, and this is just going to show up, and then, oops, I'm gonna show a different thing first here. We can also remove stuff. So I can purge the example job to make room for this mega batch job. So then example goes away, and the mega batch comes through, and now everything here is completed. So that's sort of no matter in a nutshell. And that's kind of what this talk is going to be about. All right, so time passes, and now everything is real time. And I want to sort of set the tone for the rest of this talk at this point. It's not going to end in Ember install. There's no add-on that makes it so you can automatically have real-time features. This is going to be a case study about how I did this custom implementation on top of a custom API using Ember tools. Hopefully that's still useful. I think that the lessons learned are kind of generally applicable even if the code is not. So to break this down, sort of five steps. We want to understand the API, break down the problem, make it work for one page, find the right abstractions for all the other pages, and then celebrate. So the way that Nomad handles this real-time capabilities in its API is by using long polling, using an index query param. Each URL will maintain a monotonic index, and that index is sent back as the xNomad index header in every single response. So if you make a request to job job one, it's going to immediately resolve because you haven't provided an index query param. If you make one with index equals one, when the current index is 10, it again is going to immediately resolve because the index is earlier than the current index. But if you make it equal to 10 and it's 10, then the server is going to keep that request open until the server state changes, and then it's going to respond with the new index value. This is sort of it visualized. You make an initial request, server responds. With that response, you can do stuff with the data, 
and then you can take that index value to create your next request. And then this time the server's gonna hold on to it, and then it'll close it once the state has changed. And this may seem a little strange, because we're all web developers and we stay on top of stuff. And we think, well, why aren't you using WebSockets? Have you heard of service and events? Why don't you just change the API? This is common stuff. And the answer here is that this API already exists. APIs can't always be changed on the whim for the benefit of the UI. And this app predates the web UI, or this API, excuse me. The API also works fine. It's actually really good. It's a low-tech solution that's just based on HTTP 1.1. It's entirely stateless. If a connection gets closed, you just make it again. And it's naturally fault-tolerant. So Nomad is already highly available. If a server goes down, a new server is elected the leader. It doesn't need to know your WebSocket subscriptions to continue functioning. So that's the API. Let's break down the problem here. What we need to do is we need to implement long polling. Then we need to update pages to use long polling. And then we need to re-render all of the pages and all the things when the long polls resolve new data. So there's always that guy on Hacker News that likes to trivialize everyone's work by redoing it in Bash. So I'm trying to get ahead of the story here by doing it in Bash myself. <laughs> so this is long polling in Bash. First thing we need to do is set an initial index value. And then we can use that to use curl to create, to fetch this URL. And then we have an infinite loop here that is going to, excuse me, we're already in the infinite loop. This loop is going to read over the headers, find the xnomad index header, update the index of that value, and then we do stuff with the data, and then the loop will turn over and we use this new index value. And that's all there is to it. There we go, we've made it work. Uh, whenever I'm doing any code at all, this is sort of my to-do list. I first wanna make it work, and then I wanna make it nice, and then I wanna make it fast. And making it nice is the really hard part. And this is one of those squishy subjective words, like what does nice mean? I thought we worked with logic. But the fact remains that I'm sure we've all written code we're proud of. We've also all written code that we're not proud of. And we've worked with code we like, and we've worked with code we just did not like. So, so what gives? Why is that? I mean, if there are so many ways that we can implement anything, how do we choose the best way to implement something? <laughs> I chose this picture because it's fitting by the book, but I also just love this kid's expression, because like, this is what you look like when you're faced with the paradox of choice for the first time. And it's super important, because if you just ignore this problem of saying, making it nice, then what you do is you just make it work over and over again. And eventually, you have this house of cards as a code base, and it's going to collapse under the complexity of it all. Collapse is one of those weird physical words, and we work in a digital medium. So I also want to sort of give some of the symptoms I think when I think of code collapsing. You get inaccurate project estimates where you think it's gonna take four hours and then it actually takes four weeks because you didn't understand that code fully. You get fear of certain files or subsystems because after you did a four hour project that took four weeks, you know better than to touch those files. <laughs> and then you get into this habit of habitually refactoring because you think this time you're gonna get it right. This time you truly understand all the moving parts. And this leads to unhappy developers who don't want to work in this code at all. And more insidious, you get unconfident developers, either newcomers to the industry or newcomers to the code base who are seeing other people be productive but aren't productive themselves, and they think, why is this so hard? It's gotta be me. You get imposter syndrome, not because the developer is poor, but because the code is poor, and it's hard to differentiate that sometimes. So, what do you do? How do you manage this complexity? In one word, the answer is abstractions. Uh, I'm sure we've all heard this word a thousand times. We've probably thrown it around and made smug gestures afterwards, because that's what you do. Uh, I have read lots of definitions, but I'm a pretty visual person, so I've come up with a visual metaphor for you all. This is Minerva and Her Study, a 17th century masterpiece by a local hero, Rembrandt. It's masterfully done, it's got high contrast, and yet it's still pleasant. You look at her face and you think, that is a calm woman who is okay with me entering her room, even though I interrupted her reading her book. Let's compare this to Smiley and Open Sands, an original composition by yours truly in 2018. <laughs> So I would never ever say that my work is just as good as Rembrandt's because he was a master among masters and I'm just dangerous in Photoshop. <laughs> Not that I even needed Photoshop to make this, but whatever. The point I want to make is that there's a time and a place for both of these. Smiley and Open Sands is 100% abstract. Minerva and her study is 0% abstract. Sometimes you want 0% abstract. You need complete control over your implementation. So this is probably something that's in your core competencies. For Nomad, we wrote all of our own scheduler algorithms because that's what our product is. But the downside here is it becomes, it takes a long time to implement this and it's really tedious to work on it after the fact. Compare that to 100% abstract with Smiley and OpenSans 
And it's great, for instance, if you're an e-commerce site, you don't want to have to deal with credit card transactions. If you can do that with one line of code, you're going to do it, because that's crazy if you wouldn't. But that comes with downsides also, where now you're stuck with this very rigid abstraction. If you don't like it, you're sort of stuck. You can try and work around it, but that's also bad. So the thing is, there's just no true Goldilocks level of abstraction. It's always going to be situational. All right, so keep that in the back of our minds. Let's go back to this checklist. All we've done so far is made it work, but we actually haven't done that because we wrote it in Bash. So <laughs> let's, let's look at the other to-do list because I think that's a little more favorable. All right, step three, that's a little better because I'm kind of like, what, eight minutes into this talk? <laughs> so let's make it work for one page. This should be all right. So we need to make changes to the data layer. The data layer includes our adapters, our serializers, and our models. We need to make changes to the adapters because that deals with URLs. And we actually don't need to make changes to the serializers or models because it turns out someone thought to make Ember data nice, so now the abstractions make sense here. For the adapters, we need to introduce this index query param, but we only want to conditionally use it because we want to allow for non-blocking requests as well. And for every adapter that supports blocking queries, we're going to need to make this change. So here's a route, and this is how we would change it to do conditionally, to conditionally watch requests. Uh, adapters have this concept of adapter options, which you can pass into find record or find all, and then handle on the other side. So here's watch true. And now inside of here, which is this watchable adapter, which is going to be a base class for all of my adapters that have blocking query support, I can look at the snapshot to see if this watch adapter option is true, and if it is, I can do stuff. I don't know what that stuff is yet, but at least now we understand this developer interface. So we need to make this change here. How do we track the xnomad index variable? The way that I've done it is by creating a watchlist service. Services are great because you can just sort of make one and stick it anywhere. This is what Ember data looks like. Uh, this is how it functions out of the box. So inside this browser thing I've labeled views is basically the entirety of Ember.js. Uh, and then from there in your route code or anywhere else, you're going to make a request to the store. Store is going to communicate with the adapter. The adapter is going to hit your back end. It's going to get data back. It's going to get that payload and give it back to the store. Store will then use the serializer to normalize the data, which will then hand it back to the store, which will provide you models to use inside your view. So you don't have to think about all that JSON munging, which is wonderful. And now we can just do this little trick. And now we have a service that can communicate with our adapter and back and forth so we can track these uh, index values. It ends up looking like this inside of the adapter. So here's in watchable JS again. We're now seeing if that watch adapter option is true, we can set on our query params index equal to the index for the URL as provided by the watch list service. And on the other side, when we're handling the response, this is a place where we know the new index value. So with that new index, we can set it using the watch list service again. So that's the public API for this service. What does it actually look like, though? It's pretty much a glorified just JavaScript object. Um, it really is just a JavaScript object. That's the wonderful thing about JavaScript. It's just everything's an object. Uh, I put some write protections in here so you can't accidentally blow the whole list away, but aside from that, it's just an object. So now let's make changes to the route. The model hook is going to stay the exact same because we still want to immediately get the current state of the model in question. That way you immediately get a view, and then we're going to pull after the fact. So now we need some sort of polling mechanism to continuously fetch the model using our new adapter option. Well, I really like that while loop in Bash. I thought it was pretty easy to read, but unfortunately, curl blocks, and we can't write blocking code in our routes. So enter Ember Concurrency. Ember Concurrency is super awesome and lets us write asynchronous loops that look just like synchronous ones. And tasks are easily canceled, which is just foreshadow for now. So let's look at what a polling loop looks like. Here is a route. Inside, we have the setup controller hook, which performs this task. And the task itself is doing some stuff. It's basically another infinite loop but it doesn't run in testing for reasons I'm not going to get into. And inside of that loop, we're going to attempt to find a record with our adapter option. So pretty much exactly the code we saw on our route, just in a new place, which is now inside of an Ember concurrency task. And this reads really nicely. Um, one thing that you may have noticed is that I'm not doing anything with the return value from find record. And that's because even though I'm not doing anything with it, just by calling find record and having it, it's going to mutate the underlying record inside of Ember data, which will update our model, which is just a pointer to that source of truth. So that's it, right? I mean, we made our adapter changes. We have this new service. We made route changes. Everything should work at this point. But we're all, we don't only watch records. We also watch lists, and we have to watch relationships. 
And as a consequence of both of these things, we need to remove things from the store. And that can get tricky. So let's look at watching lists. This is going to be pretty straightforward since we already wrote uh, watching a record. Now we just need to override find all, and we can use the existing index tracking service to do that. So here, params.index is going to equal this exact line that we saw in find record, but now it's in find all. Super easy. Unfortunately, watching relationships is trickier because there's no existing store method for fetching a relationship. You normally do this by reading properties on a model, which will then make the AJAX request for you, and everything sort of works out really nicely, but not for what I want to do. So the solution here is to create a new reload relationship method. It looks like that. Um, I don't expect you to read that. You probably can't even read it in the back. Uh, the point here isn't that it's hard. The point is that it's possible, which I think is pretty cool, which is, this is due to models having APIs for looking up details of a relationship. So by giving a model and a relationship name, I can use Ember Data APIs to construct the correct URL and then do all of the adapter serializer song and dance on my own to update those related records. Now we have to remove records. There's a find all case, and there's also this watch relationship case. In the find all case, we want to remove records from the store that aren't also in our new payload. Pretty straightforward. In the watch relationship case, we want to remove records from the store of the relationship type that aren't also in this payload, which is a little trickier, so I made some diagrams. This is kind of the object graph if you're looking at the has many of a job. So say we want to update the allocation relationship of the job. Alloc and allocation is the same thing. So a job currently has three allocations, but those allocations also have other relationships to nodes. So if we just use find has many out of the box, what we get is this. So job now correctly points at only two of the allocations, and the third one is quote unquote deleted if you're only looking at the job. Unfortunately, the allocation remains in the store, and we really want that thing gone. So the way you do that is by overriding find has many to use traversal APIs by getting the inverse of a relationship and then finding all of the, those types in the store. And if that inverse key equals your record's ID, then you can remove it. So that's going to remove all three of the allocations, but since we just got two new ones in the payload, we're going to push those back into the store and everything will be good. So that's gonna look like this, uh, which has an immediate problem here where this node is now pointing at a non-existent thing. And that may look good, and then suddenly you change pages and it doesn't. I can tell you that from experience. So how do you deal with this? Uh, I wrote this function called remove record, which uses store.push in an interesting way. Typically we think of store.push as the way to take payloads and put them in the store. But we can also think of it as a low level API that uses JSON API as an interface to manipulate records that are in your store. So with this function in this object graph, you can imagine a sample JSON API as shown in that comment below, where it's, it's an object, the ID of the allocation's ID, type allocation, and then the relationships for it are all nulled out. So job is null, and node is null because they're both belong to relationships, and evaluations is an empty array because it has many relationship. So after that, we get a clean object graph, but I have to hit pause here, because I'm certain there's one person at least in this audience that thinks this is the most ridiculous code anyone has ever written. Why are you doing this? Ember Data should do it for you. And I know that person exists, just statistically, because I was one of those people also. But you need to remember that this is actually very specific to my API. It isn't universally true that you want to remove the records on the other side of a has many. It's true in my case. I know this because that's how Nomad works. But that's just not true for all has many. I mean, Alex Jones was removed from Twitter, but unfortunately, he wasn't deleted from the universe. So, at this point, everything works. We have a new service for tracking these indices. We've overridden find record and overridden find all to optionally take this property to watch requests. And we have a new reload relationship model or method to do this new behavior for Ember Data. And we're handling removing data from the store. So, we can move on to finding the right abstractions. This is our current situation right now. We have a developer concerns for requesting models, deciding what data to pull, deciding how to pull, and deciding when to pull. All this stuff is currently in our routes. And inside of our abstracted details column is index tracking, which is currently in a service, and removing stale data, which is out of sight, out of mind, inside of adapters and serializers. So to bring back this visual metaphor, the more stuff in the developer concerns column, the closer we get to Minerva and her study. 
The more stuff in the abstracted details column, the closer we get to smiley and open sans. Now it's situational. This is a valid abstraction. I mean, after all, I just talked about how the way that I'm moving stale data isn't universally true. So maybe that should be a developer's concern. This is also totally valid. Like, all of this polling stuff, maybe you could assume that based on the type of data you're requesting. This would look something like overriding the store service. But based on what I know about Nomad and what I know about Ember data, I decided this is probably the sweet spot. So now we're going to move deciding how to pull and deciding when to pull into these abstracted details so they're outside of our route code. Starting with abstracting how to pull. So we're already using Ember concurrency tasks. And Ember already has this concept called uh, computed property macros. Turns out these two play really well together. So this is an alternative way to refactor your tasks that we saw in a lightning talk earlier. And you need to ask, your question, ask the question, what are truly the parameters right now and what are just the mechanics of polling? Because you want to hide the mechanics of polling. So this is just a plain function, higher order, that returns a task. It takes the model name, which is our true parameter, and it returns a new task that deals with all of the mechanics in here, including taking either an ID or an object to get an object, and then doing, or to get a record, and then doing this find record stuff, including the adapter options. And you'll notice that all that task stuff is basically copy-pasted from our route, except for this model name property. But that works just fine. And now we need to abstract when to pull. So currently we're starting tasks inside of the set of controller hook, which is a little specific, kind of uh, a concern that is part of when you're pulling and not pulling itself. So let's move that into a mix-in. So this is the mix-in called with watchers. And inside of here we have a watchers array and then some nice methods that can cancel all watchers and start all watchers, which will do the stuff that we need for starting and stopping, of course. So cancel all will automatically cancel and start watchers right now is an abstract method. There's also this new bit in here for uh, will transition to cancel watchers, which is omitted from an earlier slide. So now this is what our route looks like, super clean. We basically have the start watchers, we're calling it with our one watcher and what was once an Amber concurrency task is now a single line of code called watch all job. Awesome. You might think, I mean you can take us further, what is start watchers doing in there? Get rid of that, put that in the mix in. But, oops, apparently I highlighted that. <laughs> we have some other routes that aren't so obvious. So here's a different one where we have route specific behavior where we need nuance inside that start watchers uh, method. For instance, summary is a belongs to which gets handled as a normal uh, watch record but basing by reading the property off of it. And also latest development and list here are only conditionally being started based on properties of the job itself. All right, so time passes and I implement this on all of my pages and I think we're gonna be done. That should be it, right? Okay, so let's look at MongoDB because that can't be good. <laughs> okay, well, seems like everything's good. Uh, we have pending requests on the right side over here because those are our long poles waiting. Let's look at deployments. Okay, we're good. Details, all right. Things are good. Allocations, that's fine. Let's check out the server it's running on. All right. Okay. Hmm. Why do we have all these pending requests? Some of them are blocking requests, sure, but some of these things should be coming back. What is going on? Uh, well, okay. I thought step five was celebrate, but I guess we're gonna have to fight some bugs first. So, I dug into it and this is what's happening. Requests are stuck and this has nothing to do with Ember. It has nothing to do with this code we wrote. It's perfect, I assure you. <laughs> it has everything to do with browsers having a max number of connections per domain. And this is just so annoying. I mean, why is this a thing? I just don't get it. Like eight years ago, I would have thrown my hands in the air and I would have sworn at the universe. In fact, eight years ago, I said exactly this. Software engineering, the only industry where every problem you could ever encounter is the result of human error. Um, I'm pretty sure I was mad at IE6. This was like 2010, that was still a problem. Uh, nowadays, I've matured a bit and I try to be a little more optimistic. And I would say something like this. Most people are making the best decisions they can in the situations they are in. And it turns out that's the case here. So here's the RFC for HTTP 1.1. And it reads, a single user client should not maintain more than two connections with any server or proxy. These guidelines are intended to improve HTTP response times and avoid congestion. So the RFC is trying to help us out. Either by bad code or bad actors, they don't want our routers melting and our servers crashing. And browsers are actually being generous. You can have six or more concurrent connections in a browser, even though the RFC suggests two. 
But unfortunately, this still isn't good enough. This is a problem we have to solve. So what are our options? First solution is HTTP2. It's just better than HTTP1 in every single way. In fact, it's literally magic. So that's the thing you could use, but we can't. Uh, browsers will only use HTTP2 over a secure connection. And even though Nomad supports TLS, which would allow you to serve it over HTTPS, it's an optional feature, so that one's gone. We could also use domain sharding, which is a little older school of a technique, where you use multiple subdomains to bypass the MAC connections per domain limit. And it doesn't even matter if all you're doing is creating a reverse proxy to the same exact server, which is kind of what the RFC is trying to make you not do, but whatever. Uh, unfortunately, we also can't do that because Nomad isn't SaaS. Our customers run Nomad on their own machines, and we take operational simplicity very seriously. If the getting started guide for using the web UI read like this, using the web UI, the first step is DNS. I think we have a lot of things to reconsider. Okay, so what else have we got? Third solution, request cancellation. Okay, HTTP requests can be canceled. XML HTTP request objects have an abort method for triggering cancellation. Fetch doesn't, there's like a support controller thing coming, you should look into it, it's pretty cool. But anyway, XHRs, that's what Ember Data uses, so this should, be no sim this should be simple. Unfortunately, Ember Data does not provide abort hooks, because just like Fetch, it's based off promises, and promises are a wee bit optimistic. <laughs> so, we're gonna have to do request cancellation with Ember Data anyway. So we have to capture all these XHRs and some sort of cache to abort it later, and then we're gonna have to remove those XHRs from this cache when they resolve, and we need to write cancel methods that mirror all of our washable method signatures, and then we need to call those cancel methods in our polling code. So we wanna match method signatures here because we know we have that information available since that's the point where we start the poll and stop the poll. What follows is code I'm not proud of. But I think it's very important to show code we're not proud of because vulnerability and stuff. All right, so. This is, again, inside of our watchable JS adapter. And this is a horrible object called XHRs. And it's just going to track all of our XHRs based off some sort of key, which is generally going to be based off of your HTTP method and your URL, some sort of unique identifier for a request type. And then it's got a cancel method and it's got a remove method. So whenever anything gets canceled, we're going to remove every single XHR that matches that key. And the remove is going to call abort on the XHR before removing it from the cache. So, where do we capture all those XHRs? Also in this adapter, we can override AJAX option, options, which is a method in any adapter, and we can override the before send function on the AJAX options object, and then from here track the JQ XHR object so we have a handle on it. And we also need to make sure to add this always hook here, so if an XHR resolves of natural causes, we still wanna remove that from the cache. Whew. All right, cancel methods. These look a little nasty, um, but the, the key thing here is that they all result in this highlighted line here, where we're just canceling it. Basically, all we're doing is building up a URL so then we can cancel it. Not so bad, but I really wish I didn't have to write it. All right, so now we need to call these cancel methods. Fortunately, this is now in a well-factored place, so we don't have to write this in 15 different routes. I mean, imagine telling Rembrandt there was a bug in the way he painted hands. I don't think he would take that well. Uh, fortunately though, just one spot. So now inside of our finally block, which is going to get called whenever we call cancel all tasks in the Ember Concurrency API, and we're going to say store, get this adapter, cancel find record, using model name and ID, which is the exact same arguments we used for find record in the first place. Whew. Unfortunately, this doesn't quite work. There's some unforeseen consequences here with an error handling. So an aborted XHR results in an abort error being thrown but we don't want an error thrown in this case because we expect this abort. This is expected behavior, and our app's like, whoa, man. Um, so we need to handle this abort error case in our adapter find methods. And that's how, this is how it looks. Inside a find record, we're now going to add this catch block to what is normally just a return this.ajax, and we're going to use abort error, which we've imported from Ember data, and then just return in that case. Otherwise, we'll throw the error. So this is kind of unfortunate, but it's just the downside of promise-based control flow, is you sort of have two paths. You have a good path and you have a bad path, and when it goes in the bad path, bad things happen. <laughs> so at this point, though, we are bug-free, I swear, and we can celebrate. So some people celebrate by drinking, others by dancing. I celebrate by sitting alone and going into a deep state of self-reflection. <laughs> I'm very fun at parties. So let's look back at what we built here, all right? So this is, again, our Ember Data diagram. 
Um, we, in, we introduced a new service for managing indices, and we created new methods for reloading data and canceling requests in, this, in our adapters. And we created new methods for removing data from the store whenever we needed to. We also wrote polling code to continuously along poll and stop things on demand. And we introduced reusable patterns for adding real-time behaviors to any page. And this sounds like a lot of stuff, and it is a lot of stuff, but I also want to look at all the code we didn't write. So Ember Data already shipped with an architecture for maintaining an interface with a backend. It already has a way to make any data consistent from within the app. It's already doing all the state management for records for you. And I actually laughed at Tom Dale's thunk joke because that's a nightmare. Um, and we have a well-rounded modern approach to asynchronous control flow with Ember concurrency that we didn't have to write ourselves. Plus, an object and inheritance model that makes it really easy to build abstractions that come from Ember's object layer. And what I've called views here, this browser, that's like the entirety of Ember.js, including the render layer. I just didn't even talk about it. Uh, this includes key value observations, which is key for updating views, speedy re-renders, which makes this actually functional, data down actions up, which makes it so there were no bugs in this code that pre-existed that surfaced when I introduced this new behaviors, and two-way data binding. I, like five years ago, the only things people wanted to talk about were two-way data binding. And now, it's just so boring and solved, it didn't even make it into my talk, which is a wonderful thing. Like, consider the distribution of code that gets run to bring real-time views to the users of Nomad. Uh, this is unscientific, but I am certain I am not the primary author of that code. There's so much stuff that's being run within Ember, Ember Data, and the entire add-on layer. So the takeaways from this talk here are that products are all trying to be unique and differentiated, which is at odds with frameworks which are only trying to solve common problems. But we can use add-ons and build on top of Ember to create great new things. And if we think like framework authors when we built that software, we might withstand the test of time and keep our coworkers happy. Do have one more thing, though, <laughs> because got to do that. Nomad UI is entirely open source, so this is the pull request that introduced these live updating views. I didn't talk about testing at all, but I have receipts. I wrote them. <laughs> HashiCorp actually loves open source and Ember.js. Uh, Console Vault and Nomad are all open source products with open source UIs written in Ember.js. And Terraform Enterprise, although not open source, is still Ember. So if you were looking for reference implementations, check out our repos. If you want to give us a pull request, we'll gladly look at it. And if you really, really want to contribute, you should check out our careers page. Thank you.